sins and griefs to bear. Chapter 7, verse 24 and following. And once you find it, go back and try to sing it. sing that song yes. in Vacation Bible School? Okay. Alright. Um, well, we're, we're finishing up the, the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus ended up saying that right beliefs produce right behavior. And I've been trying to stress as we've gone through the Sermon on the Mount, beliefs are not what you say you believe. Beliefs are really what you demonstrate. And I join that with a verse of scripture from over in James. Faith without works is dead. Faith is what you believe. If you're not willing to exercise your faith, to demonstrate your faith, you don't really believe it. Um, and so... With this passage of scripture we're going to look at tonight, this, I don't want to say it's a parable, but Jesus finishes his message with this closing illustration. The Sermon on the Mount has lasted how many chapters? Three chapters. Chapters 5, 6, and 7. Jesus has talked about a variety of things. And then he closes his message by saying, you, you know all of these things that we've just been going through? These three chapters of things? He says, let me, let me just tell you. With regard to these three things, everyone who hears these words of mine, and what? And puts them into practice. This goes right along with what James writes. Be ye doers of the word not hearers only. Because if anybody is a hearer and not a doer, they're like what? A man that looks into a glass, says, my oh my, you got problems. And rather doing something to correct the problems, straightway, sets the mirror aside, goes on his way. I used to use the illustration of being like you and I waking up in the morning on a Sunday morning. We know that we've got to come to church, Chuck. Right. The Saturday night bath has already become a mess as we slept That's overnight. Right. And we get up and our hair is standing at all wild angles. we got slobber on our face That's from where we drooled in the middle of the night. You know, we've got stubble all over our face. We end up saying, you know what? Looking at the mirror, that guy needs some help. 
And rather than doing something to get ourselves cleaned up, we just walk out the door. That's what James says is a person that goes into the Word of God and they don't do anything with it. They hear it, but they don't put it into practice. And Jesus is saying here with this sermon, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, all of these things that I've told you, unless you put them into practice, this is what's going to happen to you. The storms of your life are going to come. These trials and these tribulations that, that I'm trying to save you from, they're going to come. And if you have not built on these words that I have, you're going to find that your house is going to collapse. Uh, what are some of the things, if you look back through the Sermon on the Mount? I'm going to go back to starting with the 21st verse of the 5th chapter. Chapter 5, verse 21. What's Jesus saying about here? You've heard it said, thou shalt not. Tim, you were just talking about it. Was his name Dawes? Desmond Dawes. Desmond Dawes. We've got up there number six on the list. Jesus says, you heard that thou shalt not kill. So we go around and pat ourselves on the back. We say, I never killed anybody. Jesus comes along and says, that's not just what the Father had in mind. It's not a matter of whether or not to kill anybody. It's whether or not you're allowing anger to build up within your heart. That's what that whole section is there, verse 21 through um, verse 22, 21, 22. You've heard it was said to people long ago, don't murder, and anyone who murders is going to be subject to judgment. But, <laughs> I'm telling you, anyone's angry with his brother without will be subject to judgment. And anyone who says to his brother, Raka, which if I'm not mistaken means empty-headed. Basically, your anger, as your anger level increases, your opinion of the person that you're angry with lessens their value. So you've gone from just being angry to them to now you're basically saying that they're an empty-headed person. He says, again, anyone who says to his brother Raka is answered with the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says... You fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. In other words, you've reduced the person to being just a complete idiot and not, a worth, not worth our time. Jesus, I feel like in this passage of Scripture, is saying what you really need to be concerned about isn't so much about whether or not you've killed somebody. You need to be concerned about the anger within your heart that just keeps escalating. Because the anger within your heart can escalate to a point but you decide the person is not even worth having around. The world would be better off without them. Isn't that what happens when somebody kills somebody else? They have reduced the value of the person's life to an inconvenience. You inconvenience me. I would just assume you were off the face of the earth. Jesus has said here, if you look up here, um, in the 17th verse, chapter 5, he says, look, folks, don't think that I'm coming to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to what? Fulfill them. What does that mean? I have come to give you a fuller understanding of what God had in mind. You see, the real problem isn't whether or not you're killing somebody. Your real problem is, is your attitude toward people. And your attitude toward people is developed over time of whether or not you feel like a person retains any value the more angry that they make you. And sadly, I think statistics will bear out most of the time the homicides that take place, the murders that take place, are not just among strangers. It's among the people that we know. 
when you get the, when, when you hear about the shootings and whatnot that have taken place, the apartment complexes and stuff, is it just with shootings of primarily, is it just strangers? No, it's family members. Police will end up telling you. The calls that they're most concerned about, domestic disputes. What's going on within the domestic dispute? The valuation of the person's worth has been diminished to the point I would just assume you were gone from the face of the earth because you have no value in my eyes. Jesus is offering a warning here. He says, look folks, I am concerned about the murder. I don't want you to believe that I'm not concerned about the murder. But the real problem isn't so much the murder. The real problem is with anger in your hearts that gets out of control. What have I been preaching now for the last two Sunday mornings with the morning message? We've looked at a passage of Scripture, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. What was it that I preached about that message this morning? We have short-circuited a three-step process that is outlined by John in that verse of Scripture. Most people, they will end up saying, I just want the forgiveness. But that's not what John says. He says, first off, before you ask for forgiveness, you need to confess. What does the word confess mean? It means that the, the Greek word literally means to say the same thing about something that God says about it. Confess means that you end up saying, God, I know that I've got this anger in my heart. I may feel justified, and you may very well be justified in your anger. But you end up saying, God, this anger is in my heart, and it's wrong. Because God, if I continue to harbor this anger in my heart, I'm concerned that my anger is going to get the best of me. You been there? Why do we hold on to that anger? Because it feels good. We may feel justified, but we end up saying, you know what, Lord? I could have a lot of fun doing the stuff to that person that they deserve to have happen to them. God says, mm -mm -mm. no, no, no. You've got an anger level within your heart. See, the do not kill. Killing comes as a result of the anger level within your heart building up. First, you just get angry. So did your judgment. Then you say rocket, then you end up saying fool. It is devaluing the worth of the person. And Jesus is saying here at the end of the sermon, now look, you can either put this practice, this teaching of mind into practice, and start calling a spade a spade, confessing your sins, say, God, I know that I've got this anger in my heart, and I know it's not pleasing to you. How does God want us to respond? to people that are our enemies. Well, look over verse 43 of chapter 5. What does it say there? What does chapter 5, verse 43 say? Love your enemies. What was that, Joe? Love your enemies. Do what to them? Love them. <laughs> I love them, all right. <laughs> God says that ain't the kind of love I'm asking for. How do you think, how do you think, Stephen, in the Bible that got stoned to death? How was he able to do what he did at the end of his life? What did he do at the end of his life? As they were stoned to death, he did what? Father, lay not this charge to their account. How was Jesus on the cross able to look and say, Father, forgive them? Or they don't know what to do. Because they put into practice what Jesus was saying. You've got to guard against the anger level in your heart, probably even more so than you have to against the killing of somebody. Because the killing of somebody will only come after the anger level has gotten out of control. See, that's the fuller understanding that Jesus is trying to get across. 
You don't believe me? What's the next section that he's talking about here? After murder, down in the 27th verse of Matthew chapter 5. What's he talking about there? What's he talking about down in 27? Adultery. He says you've heard it said. You shouldn't commit adultery. That's right. We shouldn't commit adultery. The problem isn't with adultery, though, Jesus says. The problem is with the heart. And it has allowed adulterous thoughts to take root. I'm try Jesus says, I'm trying to give you a fuller understanding of what God had in mind when he's saying this. He didn't just want you to stop doing these behaviors. He wanted you to change your beliefs. How do we end up allowing adultery to enter our lives? First, we allow it with our heart. Jesus says, do you not understand when you've said in your heart it's okay for me to look after, look at a woman to lust after? You've already committed adultery. Because in your heart, you've said it's okay. You're just looking for an opportunity to put it into practice. And Jesus is saying, if you don't get that thought process under control, when the opportunity comes along and it presents itself, you're going to go with it because you've already okay with your heart. You need a fuller understanding. It's not just about stopping the behavior. It's stopping the belief that you and I hold on to. Why does a person engage in adulterous thoughts? Is it fun? Have you done it? I have. Is there pleasure in sin? Absolutely. If you've not come to this understanding, you sin because you enjoy it. care what the sin is. Why do I agree? Because I enjoy it. Why do I decide to be lazy sometimes? Because I enjoy it. Why does a person gossip? Because they enjoy it. Why does a liar lie? Because they enjoy it. Why does a thief steal? Because they enjoy it. Why does a killer kill? Because they enjoy it. There is pleasure in sin. Jesus says the sin isn't just the action. The sin is the thought that leads to the action. And as I tried to stress with the message this morning, again from 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, verse 9, if we confess our sins, if we will reach that point that we start labeling sin a sin, why, and I used this illustration this morning, not to pick on smoking, do I believe that smoking is a sin? Yeah, people say, you really think that's a sin? Why would I say that it's a sin? We went over this this morning. Why does God label things as a sin? It's not good for you. It's not good for you. Gluttony. Why is it labeled a sin? Because it's not good for you. Why is lying labeled a sin? It's not good for you. It's going to cause you problems. Why is adultery labeled a sin? Because it's not good for you. It's going to cause you problems. Things that cause you problems, that's what God labels as sin. It's not that God just decides, well, this is okay. God wants us to understand that those things that he's labeled as sin, he's telling us they're sin because they're going to cause problems for you. And you and I need to reach that point. If we ever want to break free, you've got to start saying the same thing about sin that God does. That's what the word confess means. If we confess our sins, you start saying it's wrong. And I probably should have followed up on that thought this morning with regard to the message. Do, do you have a problem doing something that you know is wrong? Well, I know that I'm trying to go up the river to this place, but I know that I'm going the wrong direction. I'm going to keep going that direction. You and I would laugh and say, that's stupid. But how many times in our life do we know that what we're doing is wrong and you keep doing it? But I'm just telling you, there's something psychological that happens whenever you label the behavior wrong and you start saying, you know what, I'm doing this wrong. I told you this morning that I feel like the alcoholic has to reach the point that they end up saying, the alcohol is wrong. It's just flat out wrong. A lot of people try to dabble around with it, think that they can end up controlling it. They don't control it. It controls them. 
I've seen smokers do the same thing. Until a person is willing to label the behavior as wrong, they start seeing it the same way that God sees it. God looks down and he sees that the person struggled with this and he says, I'm telling you right now that's bad. We stand there and we say, oh God, no, no, no. You don't know what you're talking about. Confessing your sins means that you start saying, God, you know what? You're right. It's a problem. The alcoholic will never get free of alcohol until they're labeling it a sin. It's bad for them. The drug addict, same thing. The adulterer, the same thing. The glutton, the same thing. Any sin, until you take that first step and say, God, it's wrong. If we confess our sins, start saying the same thing. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We want the forgiveness. Many times we skip that first part. We just say, I just want the forgiveness. God says, the forgiveness isn't all that I'm after here. God wants us to be forgiven. God wants us to be free from the bad behavior. And you and I will never be free from the bad behavior until we're willing to start saying about the behavior what God has been saying all along. It's bad. We confess our sins. He is faithful, meaning every time, every time you and I come to Him, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the last part that I try to stress this morning, the three parts of that verse. Yeah, the third part. Of this. Third part is, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He works with us to get that bad behavior out of our life. Because I tell you what, those behaviors that we've got ingrained in us, they're deeply rooted. And it may not be an instantaneous delivery. I praise God when I hear about Christians, they end up saying, I came to the Lord and He took away all of these vices that they had. I praise the Lord. But I can tell you this much as a pastor, most of the people that I work with within the churches, it hasn't been an instantaneous deliverance. For most people that come to know Jesus Christ, it is a rebirth. What does a rebirth mean? You come in as a baby, not as a full-grown adult, and there is a growing process that you have to learn to walk in the likeness of Christ. The church doesn't need to be crucifying Christians that come on board and all of a sudden they're not acting like the Apostle Paul or St. Peter. The church needs to walk with them on a journey because I can tell you this much, my life has been a journey and it still is. Thank God I'm not who I used to be. Praise God, I'm not who I want to be. Because one of these days, I am going to be like Him. I will see Him as He is. So Jesus is saying to him in this passage of Scripture, look, these teachings that I'm giving you, I haven't just preached them to you so that you could sit in the church service and listen to them once or twice. I preached them to you so that you're really taken to heart. Because if you will build your life on these, they'll help to keep you standing strong. You decide, eh, I'm not going to pay any attention to them. You're going to find that when the tough times come, your house is going to fall down flat. I don't want to reach, I'll close with this, um, over there in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus ends up talking about people that seek after all the things the world has to offer. They're, they're looking for nice clothes. They're looking for what they're going to eat, their next meal, so on and so forth. Jesus says, that's what the pagans do. He says, I've got, I've got a suggestion for you. Don't go chasing after all those things. Your Heavenly Father knows that you need those things. First thing that you need to do is seek His kingdom and His righteousness. And all of these other things will be given on you. I couldn't help but think, and we talked some about this prior to the service. People that as they start to get blessed by God, I don't have time for you, God. 
Does it happen? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus says, you and I need to seek first the kingdom of God. I, I back when I was a kid, we used to listen to a, um, a music group out of Mobile College out of Mobile, Alabama called Truth. Roger Breland was the leader of that group. And my mom and dad, because they wanted us to have access, Christian music was young back in the 1970s. There weren't a lot of contemporary Christian music groups. And um, really, Truth was kind of cutting edge. Uh, and my parents wanted us as, as boys to be able to have that music. So they bought the music and played the, played the records. We would have the Christian records. We grew up with Gaither being played in our home, <coughs> the Truth played in our home, so on and so forth. But I remember Roger Breland ended up saying at one of the concerts one time, because I think it was recorded live, but he ended up saying, look folks, if you're too busy for God, you're just too busy. If you don't have time for God, folks, your life is way too busy. Because i got news for you, and I think that Roger would agree with me on this. You don't have anything that you've got had it not been for God. And if you can't take time to thank Him for what He's done for you, you got your priorities messed up. I understand if people are forced into situations that are beyond their control. But I'm telling you about when things are under our control. Whether it's our time or whether it's our money. I've used this illustration before. I'll close with this illustration. I, I, look, I really will close. Reminded of a man that, you know, he was he struggled financially. Um, he was trying to he was trying to raise his family on five hundred dollars a week. And it was tight. But he was he was faithful to God. He, he tried to be in church and he tried to, to give faithfully. With the five hundred dollars a week he would he would take 10% out of it and give it to God. $50 a week. Give it to God. And over time, God blessed him. And that $500 a week job turned into a $5,000 a week job. And the man, when it came time to give to the Lord, he ended up saying, now rather than giving God $50 a week, I'm having to give God $500 a week. And when he went to write out that check, $500 is like, ooh, that's a lot of money. And it kind of ate on him. So when you talk to the preacher about it, he said, preacher, back when I was only making $500 a week and I gave God $50, it really didn't bother me much. But he says, now I'm making $5,000. And I write out that check for $500. He says, it really bothers me. What should I do? The preacher looked at it and said, that's simple what you need to do. You just need to pray that God gives you back your $500 a week job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jesus ended up giving us that illustration from Matthew chapter 6. He said, because what? There's constantly going to be the pull as you go through life to chase after things. Things aren't what you need. God is who you need. You won't do anything or go anywhere without God's blessing. Don't forget God. And sadly, I'm afraid that's what's happened with America. And I'll go ahead and put it out there on the YouTube channel. Why are our churches sitting empty? And if anybody dares to watch it, I know that some people say, well, it's the coronavirus. And I'm, I'm sympathetic with those that don't feel safe. But before the whole coronavirus thing, why are our churches going downhill? Because other things have become more important to God. There was a time within our society that people would say, it's the Lord's day. What does that mean? For me, personally, when I hear the Lord say, this is not my day. It belongs to Him. 
I don't have a right to do with this day what I want. I have a responsibility to acknowledge his is. And there was a time within our society, right? The people went to church. Why don't they now? They you know, too busy. Too busy. I I need this, I need that. Jesus, I need know. You need God. So any final comments or questions or thoughts? Let's have a closing prayer and we'll pray for revival again. Father, as we get ready to leave, we do ask your blessing as we're dismissed that you might keep us safe and that you might guide us this week that we will honor you. We ask your forgiveness for the many times that we fail you. But Father, we also, we also pray tonight that you might send revival. Revive us. Uh, Father, we continue to pray that your spirit might be poured out. We know that the work of your spirit is to bring people under conviction of sin, righteousness, and the coming judgment. And Lord, as we look throughout our society, we don't see a real conviction of sin amongst people. We don't see a conviction of those things that are right and pleasing in your sight. We don't see people that are fearing a judgment. And Father, I believe that that's never going to happen unless your spirit is really poured out in people's lives. Especially the church, Father. The church needs to be revived. It's not that necessarily the church needs to be reborn. Many of the people have been saved. They're going to heaven. They need revived because they're dead. They're just, Father, they're not dead. They're almost dead. Father, we pray that your spirit might breathe new life. That you might help us once again to become the light that you call us to be. Send your spirit, Father, not just to work in the hearts of others, but work in our hearts to help us to grow more in the likeness of your Son. Again, we just ask your continued blessing. Keep us in your care. Guide us, Lord, to do your will. Forgive us when we fail you. Use us for your glory. Bring us back the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.